I'm going to show you a little example of pieces of it up close that I think will show you a little bit of these teensy tiny little dots of points. I lived in the Chicago area during my adolescent years and I would enjoy opportunities to go to the Art Institute and I remember gazing at this. You can walk right up to it and look and stand back from afar and I had the opportunity to marvel at how this multitude of tiny little points are completely indiscernible from afar. And they come together to create this amazing unity and diversity in this beautiful image. And as the Apostle Paul would say, so it is with Christ. The people of God together form a masterpiece, God's handiwork. Each of us designed in his image, each of us designed for good purpose, each an important part of a greater whole. We are not all the same. Maybe we have slightly different personalities or Enneagram numbers, but we are all one. And we're designed by the master to jointly create a cohesive composition of his image. And even together to collectively reflect the fullness of the Godhead, the fullness of God's image, and do his work here on earth. I'm going to stop sharing. We are designed in his image. As I mentioned before, I'm going to ask for your help for one second to bring that other part up. Um, in Paul's, I need your help. Let me do that. Yeah, I do. Thank you. Um, in the NIV, Paul says it's God's handiwork, the New Living Translation. In the New Living, sorry, <laughs> we're having some technical, technical difficulties here for a moment. I apologize. Um, Paul in the NIV translation says we are God's handiwork. In the New Living translation, it says we are God's masterpiece. Several other translations, the KJV, the ESV, say we are God's workmanship. But as I read to you early, earlier, I love how the NRSV puts this, that we are what he has made us. I think that's really the essence of what Paul intended, right? Just before this, he said that for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God so that no one can boast. We are what he has made us. He is the author and originator of our lives and of our faith. In Genesis 1, 26 to 28, it recounts the creation of humankind. And it teaches us that humankind is made in his image. Genesis 1, 27 says, so God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. We know this is a really important point because it's said three times in a row and it's said in th three slightly different ways, adding a little more to truth to it each time, fleshing it out a little bit more that's done for emphasis, but it's also done to embed the teaching in our memory and so we can hide it away in our soul. Every human is made in the image of God. Whatever your appearance is, whatever your proclivities are, whatever your personality is, whatever your upbringing has been, your family of origin, the stuff of life you've lived through, you were made in the image of God. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew but many, many, many years later, the whole Old Testament was translated into Greek, which is known as the Septuagint translation. And there's the word that for the image that's um, the Greek is icon. It's where we actually get the English word icon. That there's a, a representation, an image or a likeness that's a representation of something, like a widely known symbol or person. Right? We have pop icons. We have celebrities, maybe a social media icon would be called an influencer or something like that. Or we have religious icons that are a symbol of an image or likeness of something. Human beings were made as an icon of God and a likeness of God, meaning we're spiritual beings with moral likeness, able to discern the good. We are made pure, unencumbered to love and serve God wholeheartedly. That's who we were created to be. Human beings are the pinnacle, the crown of creation, created to share this unique relationship with the Lord. 
that we are spoken to with direct communication by the Creator, given the capacity and the responsibility to be stewards of creation, and entrusted as the caretakers of God's goodness on earth. And very importantly, we are designed for oneness. We see this oneness in the very nature of God, in whose image that we are made. We have one God in perfect oneness, yet three persons. The Godhead is not a hierarchy. The Godhead is a circle. It's a unity in diversity. We're going to talk about that more a little bit later. God's good creation was designed for oneness. That there was this natural symbiosis created in all things, a, a, a shalom. It says God called it good, shalom, that there was peace, harmony, wholeness, completeness, tranquility. All of those things together make up the idea of shalom, all is right. This beautiful, easy oneness with God, with ourselves, with others, with the world, and the glory of God illuminated all of life. And then, dun, 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 the fall happened, and humans chose independence. From Genesis 3 onwards, the whole world, all creation and the people in it, are marred by the entrance of evil, disease, destruction, death. Evil is an intruder on God's good creation. The image, the icon, is cracked, and the image distorted. The rest of the Old Testament, the New Testament, indeed, we can attest to the days of our lives, recount the soap opera that life became because of it. People are at odds with God, with themselves with one another, with the world. It certainly felt really apparent in these times. Oneness became otherness. Paul teaches throughout his writings that because of this moment, all creation is groaning for redemption. But God's remedy to the world, even as Paul teaches from the beginning of chapter 2 here in Ephesians, to the world the Son is given. In love, Jesus Christ, God the Son, came in the flesh to save us from the havoc of sin, not just